Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining today. My name is Andy James, and today I'm going to be spending some time talking about Blue Air Compute. We've had a series of webinars and building up to uh, to this one. Um, and Blue Air Compute's really, really exciting. It's been part of our technology for a long, long time, and I'll talk about some of the history uh, of that as we go through this webinar. But it really what makes you think about seismic data and how you can move your computations uh, to your data in, in a different way as well. So that's the focus of this webinar and I hope you find it uh, useful and, and informative. So the agenda for today is a quick recap on some of the previous webinars. We've been setting a foundation, talking about some of the underpinning of um, our technology and the way we store data. But then we're also going to talk about um, how we approach data and computational workflows today and how we can look at them a little bit differently with Blueware Compute. Obviously, um, seismic data is big and I've used this elephant theme throughout these, these webinars to kind of represent moving big things into the cloud is, is very difficult sometimes um, and particularly using them within the cloud, but uh, Blueware VDS really enables you to deliver a seismic data re revolution. So first up, um, a couple of webinars uh, from the past. The first one was around OpenVDS. If you're not familiar with um, OSDU, you should really go check them out. O OSDU is the Open Subsurface Data Universe. It's a really awesome collection of companies, oil and gas subsurface companies, um, cloud vendors, uh, service providers and software vendors coming together to develop standards around how we store and use subsurface data. So it's a really um, awesome format. There's about 150 uh, companies involved with it at this point. It's got a lot of momentum. It's a really exciting place. Blueware contributed OpenVDS as a format into OSDU. And in our first webinar, I talked about that. The key focus of that was talking about the fact that it's a cloud ready format that really leverages the cloud technology itself. But it doesn't only enable you to store data in the cloud, it really focuses on how you use data in the cloud. So you're not just locking data into um, cloud from an archive perspective, you are, um, you're actually using the data um, within your workflows. It's really pretty cool. In the next webinar, I talked about VDS. VDS is our commercial um, toolkit that reads uh, from, from the data and compared some of the features between VDS and OpenVDS. And in reality, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of things that are very much the same. The key difference is the ability to compress VDS data, which isn't available in OpenVDS, but also the, the ability to use um, adaptive streaming where you can deliver um, different signal quality from your data into workflows, which we exploit in, uh, in, in downstream activities such as our interactive AI product and things like that as well. So if you haven't seen those, they're pretty good. Go check them out um, and they give a good foundation for the discussion we're having today. So the next thing I want to do is talk about how we think about computations today. Everything starts with data. If you look at the way um, our technology, our interpretation um, applications are architected, we always typically have the data within the computer. So we end up moving these large seismic data volumes around, these elephants, if you like. We move them um, into the computer before we can load them into memory and then work on the data. We then decide we're going to perform some algorithms or functions against that data. And so we start by doing a function, maybe doing another function, say spectral decomposition or something like that. And then we create an output of the data. So this is a typical interpretation application workflow that we do um, today. There's a couple of challenges with that. One is we end up creating more and more data. So over time, during the interpretation workflow, we duplicate more and more data. And the second thing is if we introduce new data, 
we have to repeat that same workflow, those same computational functions over and over again. So these are kind of two challenges with the existing paradigm of applications that we use today. Now, if you look at the image um, formatting as a, as a parallel example, granted image sizes are not as big as, uh, as, as seismic data, but things are approached a little bit differently. And let's take Photoshop, for example, here. I've got this great picture of the uh, Serengeti. Once again, my elephant theme comes in here. And I really like this image, but I don't want a herd of images. I really just want one lonesome image because it, elephant because it makes a statement. So I can use a crop and this is equivalent to taking a selection or a subset of data, reducing the amount of data that you need to work on from the start. So we can crop our data and then we can apply an effect. This could be a particular workflow, such as a conditioning workflow that we might produce against seismic data. And so in this case, I apply a paint stroke effect. I recolor it, one more example. This could be an eight bit um, uh, transformation on the data, for example. And then maybe I want to do something like dress it up with a frame. In the end, I have this great finished product and I've got exactly what I want from, from the data itself. And so this is how an image um, processing workflow changes. But in Photoshop, the data remains unchanged. That host image, the original image, remains unchanged and the individual steps are over supplied as a set of um, functions or filters against the data. And Photoshop calls this non-destructive editing. And so we can apply the same concept to seismic data. We host that data in the cloud and then we perform filters and steps against the data as we go through. Now, this can only be achieved because of the way we've developed our platform. Blueware, the Blueware platform really came from a sort of a computer games DNA. This was the original founding um, initiative behind the product. How can we take a game engine principles and apply it to oil and gas data. And this requires you to really think differently around how you architect the data, how you architect the computations and the visualization. And game companies today exploit this throughout um, the game industry where there's really very few engines. I think there's two or three primary engines that are being used by game studios to produce massive amounts of game content. If you think about a game, they have these massive, massive worlds, but they can really get these super interactive um, performance with the visualization that they do. And that's because they're really processing the information that you need to do the particular task that you want to do. So they're not loading the whole world into the memory. They're just loading the things that you need to work on. And this is the foundation of our compute engine. It's built in synergy with the data the computations and the visualizations and all of the things are orchestrated in such a way that we can perform functions at a very, um, very performant way. We've optimized this through GPU optimization, through multi-threading, um, through creating a graph of actions that use um, acyclic uh, functions. And we also create um, extensibility through plugins that basically can read our VDS through streaming on the cloud, perform the calculation, and then the output VDS on the back end as a virtual v VDS. You're not creating new data, you're serving up data that's been computed against. So it's a real powerful way of approaching things, very different from the applications that you see in today's um, interpretation environment. A traditional computation workflow takes data where you load the data, you select a region, and the results of that selection get computed against. You run the calculation. If you don't like the results when you visualize them, you have to change either the data inputs or the computation as you go through, and you have to cycle through this event. The Blueware engine works in synergy between data, computation, and visualization such that you visualize the result of running a calculation against a particular region of data. 
So it has a completely different approach and a different way of working. Putting this into a simple concept and using the constructs that I put in place in the previous webinars, our VDS is a cloud native format that can serve data up in a very fast random access way. I can get a time slice as quickly as an inline or a cross line because of the nature of the way the data is distributed against um, cloud object stores, but also what the way we've organized the data internally as well. So we leverage VDS with the ability to use adaptive streaming, which leverages our compression technology um, to deliver data directly into a computation. That computation can deliver a virtual computed data set. So you're not creating a data set at this point, you're delivering a computated, computed data set directly from the cloud. And this is served up into the computer and the workflow that you want. So this is a really powerful concept. And it's made even more powerful from, from the fact that you don't just use one of these, you can actually chain compute plugins together to produce um, a chain of execution. One of the key things about this is you may use something like an 8-bit converter in multiple workflows and that one single 8-bit converter can just be reused wherever you want it to. So you start building your compute assets and those compute assets become compute networks that chain together um, to produce really dynamic results. And then the other thing that's really powerful about this is that the virtual VDS at the end of the result is only computing exactly what needs to be computed to serve the end requirements. So if that's one particular inline, the data that's served into that compute workflow is just one inline, not the whole data set, just a very small amount of data. And this can be done very randomly as well um, to, to really give a powerful um, compute network. So it, it's, um, it's very efficient and uh, really is, is very applicable to a cloud-based environment. So compute can run locally with the workstation where you want run on the client. And this is how we evolved the technology on, in the desktop environment over the past 15 years or so, um, where the data is served up to the compute client, as it is in the top example here. But what we've done as we've evolved the technology into a cloud-based solution is created an environment where you can scale that compute out to hundreds and hundreds of nodes. And so one single compute can access multiple aspects of the data set itself and serve that data up into multiple virtual data sets, stitching the data back together. So you can start scaling out. And remember, one of the beautiful things about the cloud is that because you're leasing the compute for the time that you use it, why would you use one um, processor to do something in 10 hours where you can use a thousand processors to do things in a minute or two. And so by using the scalability of the cloud, you're only paying for the time you use the computer and you shut it down at the end of it. And then you can um, basically produce uh, really interactive workflows against massive amounts of data. And we test this against terabytes of um, uh, pre-stat data, not just small data sets, because this, the system and the, the architecture will scale up to these kind of sizes um, and we can, we can use this uh, type of data and volume. So a really powerful solution that we can, uh, we can use here. Okay, so what I want to do is actually show you some of this in action here. The, uh, the browser window here is, uh, is our scale out workbench. It's, uh, it's really a, case, a place where we can um, define a workflow. And all of this is done in the, in the web. It's a, a web browser here, and we've got a simple platform that we can um, build this on here. The data set that I'm going to use on this is the same 1.2 terabyte pre-stack data set I used in the previous webinar. So the first thing I do is create a network and name it. And I'm going to use uh, Compute Webinar, really original name here. 
And when I create the network, what it's going to do is give me a list of plugins that are available. And these are customizable, they're extensible. You can build your own plugins if you want. But the first thing I want to do is put a data source. So I put a, a VDS here, got a link out to my uh, cloud-based data set. And then I'm going to actually build a stack in workflow here. So um, I drag this stack uh, computation here. And the first thing I want to do is connect the dots. So these uh, um, make the chain between the, the data and the, uh, the, the computation. I want to use this dynamically. And the nice thing about doing a dynamic use case is I can change the data set later. This small viewer here is going to show me um, computing on the fly against that um, particular inline. And as I move to another inline, I'm performing this computation on the fly. The same applies to a cross line, and I'm computing, computing that stack absolutely on the fly here. I can also show this in a quick 3D viewer. This is an HTML5 viewer here, um, and it's essentially a 2.5D view where I can show the three different views being stacked um, on the fly and show those three different uh, surfaces as I go through. Um, so, so this is kind of cool. All right, but what if I want to um, extend this even further and use a, a near, mid and a far stack? So what I can do here is create two more stacks, move these uh, lines, connect the dots here and modify the individual stack with the parameters um, to specify that I want the first third, the second third and the first third third of the data. So just update these very quickly, go to the second one, update the second phase. And then uh, the third one was already correct, so no need to change this, perfect. Okay, now I want to go and look at another one of these um, and I'll bring it up side by side so you can see the subtle differences between the data. And the nice thing here is I can tweak the results as I go through. So you can see the differences here between the, the two different data sets. So I can tweak the data as I go through here and, and give the end user control of these parameters um, so I can tweak them. One of the key benefits as well is I could put, say, a spectral decomposition as another compute in the network. And by doing that, I can see the results of the spectral decomposition, but then I might want to tweak the um, stacking parameter. I can change that stacking parameter on the fly and see the result being passed through the spectral decomposition and see the results in my um, application. So it becomes really dynamic and really powerful. OK, I saw some questions coming up and we'll cover the Q&A in the back at uh, the back of this. So we don't have too much to go through. Um, so if you want to post questions now, um, please feel free as well. So. Um, while I was doing this, I thought, well, it was an HTML5 browser, so why not just go ahead and put this in my iPhone and see how it functioned? Um, the browser's not really been defined to make use of the, the iPhone, so it's a little bit fiddly here, but uh, um, this was just running on an LTE network in the cloud. And we showed this at uh, SEG last year um, with the stacking workflow here. So um, works perfectly fine and does demonstrate that you can start moving workflows into the cloud, move compute to the server side, to the cloud, as opposed to heavy applications having to do all of this compute functionality as well. So it gives a great architecture for uh, moving things forward. So it's kind of fun. All right, that's great, but what does it cost, right? Computer in the cloud, cloud's expensive and things like that. Well, is it? If you think about the cost of storing, data and the cost of increasing the amount of storage as you go through your interpretation workflow, we end up starting with something like a 500 gigabyte pre-stack survey, maybe duplicated and subsetted and stacked and conditioned an output to application formats multiple, multiple times, creating terabytes of data when you look at the overall workflow. And in order to keep the lineage of that data 
and the interpretation steps and the history, we end up storing the results. If you compute data on the fly, you're only really saving a tiny piece of JSON configuration that allows you to recreate that data set on the fly in the future using a particular network and a particular set of parameters and a particular conversion at the end of the life cycle. So you don't have to store all that interpreted data and all these resultant data formats. So when you start to look at storing all of this interpretation data over time versus computing on the fly for the short term um, period of time that you use it, you can very quickly get to the point where the cost of compute computation is much cheaper than the cost of storage. Now, this will really depend on what your overall interpretation workflows look like, but because the calculators are transparent on the cloud, you can make your own calculations based on your workflow. Um, and so, you know, do you really want to store terabytes of interpreted data in the cloud, or do you want to um, get back to how you interpreted it on the fly? Something to think about. One thing I'm going to show you in a future um, webinar is um, the ability to transcode the output of this data in our virtual data sets using our fast transcoder technology. You can get to our website and have a look at this, but I want to show you how you can get a computed data set all the way through to our fast transcoder and convert that data into, um, into an end user application um, so that the end user application gets all of the benefit of the data without necessarily having to change because it's being fed into its own um, native formats without changing. But that's something for a future webinar. So as I've said in the past, uh, no elephants were harmed in the making of this presentation. Um, and as a thank you for joining, Blueware will donate uh, a dollar per attendee to the International Elephant Foundation. If you're feeling generous, please um, feel free to donate uh, to that uh, worthy cause as well. And uh, you can do so by um, going to www.elephantconservation.org. And now we will happily hand over to questions. And joining me on the conference is our CTO, uh, Paul Anderson, and he'll help me um, with, with some of the questions going through. So our first question here is um, when stacking to make a time slice, are you only accessing the pre-stack data at a given time? And Paul, I'm going to let you answer yes. that while I take uh, this water. So actually, uh, the, the, one of the benefits with BDS is that we have full random access with same speed to time slices on this 4D pre-stack data set as we have with inlines or cross lines. So we can do we're actually fetching only the data needed to do the computation that was queried. So yes, we are only stacking, uh, accessing the pre-stack data at a given time. Um, second question, do I have to keep copies of things like seismic attributes on the cloud? The only thing you keep copies of is kind of the JSON or the graph itself that is stored in a database. So you don't need to uh, the, the, all the seismic attributes are live computed on demand when queried. And that, that is one of the beauties of the architecture is that um, it, it becomes very dynamic. You, 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 only, you only compute those attributes against the data that you particularly need to serve the workflow. So when you think about potentially HTML5 viewers, um, you're really doing all of the work on the server and just delivering to the HTML5 viewer what you would need at a particular time. Um, and we can access the, the, the data in a computed form in the same way that we can access the live data, the way it's stored in the cloud. Um, one of the really nice expressions that, uh, that I heard is that in, in South America, they, they consider a pre-stack data set an open data set and a post stack, a closed data set. 
The nice thing about this is that we can access the pre-stack um, data on the fly. So there's a follow up question. Um, there isn't uh, expensive to recalculate. Um, I think that we, we talked about before putting this webinar together, whether we should should go into the um, the cost stack aspect of things. And it really depends on the workflow and what what you're doing. The the. The if you look at the long term storage of storing copies of data it soon outweighs the cost of computing some of these computes are actually very very cheap because they're not big computations and the way we do the, the computation is incredibly efficient um, so so it really it really does depend on um, on on the overall process and you can also imagine that the initial cost, let's say you have a pre-stack data set, you do three different stacks near mid far on, on maybe a full stack, and then you for each of those do a 20, 30, 40 hertz, 20, 30, 40 hertz spectral decomp, you suddenly then have four times three, 12 new volumes, post-stack volumes. And to get to that calculation, you have to do some computation anyway. So but then you can uh, export or get that down to CDY or SegY or whatever your legacy application needs or use uh, these VDS endpoints uh, natively. However, now you have stored your workflow also. So that means that you can always go back, change parameters two years later, see how you arrived at these data sets with, without storing all the intermediate, for example. Yeah, and I think the other aspect of it is, is it is it expensive to 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 as a human have to go and do these repeated steps in an application, load the data, copy the data down, repeat the step within the application, save the data. I mean that that in its it, that in its own right is an expensive step as well. All, so. all the data entropy you're creating and lineage uh, challenges is, is also very expensive. Yeah, yeah, good. Do we have any other questions? So a uh, follow up question here. Have you put together a worksheet so you can compare the cost of computing as, as storage? Um, we we have and um, I was I was preparing to put that information in here, but there's a lot of parameters and variables. How long are you keeping that interpretation data online? Um, how um, what type of computer you're doing? Uh, I really, you know, this is a great opportunity to collaborate with us. And so, if you do have, um, if if you do have some particular workflows you'd like to explore, we'd love to um, uh, work with you on those and uh, and see if we can we can come up with uh, some answers. So, there's a couple more questions here. Um, Um, it can absolutely be uh, uh, done for pre-migration workflow. So you can do uh, noise removal conditioning or gather conditioning and all, all these things uh, pre-migration also. Uh, the VDS support raw shot uh, data and you can apply algorithms to uh, that as well. Um, Paul, do you want to answer the question on the, the previous question there? If the thing we save. Uh, oh yeah. So if the thing we save is now how we can what happens when you upgrade the processing engine? Um, I don't I mean, I want the original computed image. So I'm not 100% sure I understand uh, the question, but anything from the static original data that is the source you have in the cloud to any of the nodes in your computer graph can be accessed at any time. You can always go back and query from the original computed image. Yeah, so um, I, I, this is a good comment here. Uh, just something that um, came up in mind, managing the Im 
intermediately produced data might cost more than storing them. Um, that that is something that we see as a as a, a very common thread is that just dealing with that or which which one was used when. Uh, whereas if you have a well defined workflow that for this particular workflow you use this this compute configuration and this subset, it becomes very easy to document steps. And and while we haven't actually done that, the um, because because calling a particular compute to get a result is essentially an API call, just writing that into a journal is a very easy step um, to manage a, a full end-to-end -end interpretation step. It also makes it very easy to rerun uh, with when you get new data in, for example, and you re want to rerun the exact same uh, processing, the same stacking with same parameters, with same uh, spectral decomposition parameters or other condition attributes. You can then just change the original input, go back to your workflow that you did three years ago, uh, and rerun, you can always get back to any data you ever produced extremely quickly. Yeah, that would be a good workflow for uh, for for the seismic. When you get more data, better resolution coming in at a later date, you can rerun the exact workflow steps. Good. And I, I think it's important to mention that there is no different a difference from an API or user's perspective, whether it's a virtual VDS or a static VDS stored in the cloud. The access is exactly the same. OK. Yes. I think we are about done. Um, we've got you out of here in about uh, 30 minutes or so, which is uh, what we what we hope to target for. Um, I do sincerely hope you found this uh, valuable use of your time. And um, I know your time is, uh, is, is important to you, and we appreciate you spending this time with us. And if you haven't, um, if you haven't seen the previous uh, webinars, uh, I would ask that you maybe check those out. They give you some good foundation uh, to some of the things that uh, we have going on leading up to this as well. And hopefully you can attend our next uh, webinar as well. OK, so thank you very much uh, for your time today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.